Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And boy, what a journey this is today. My new best friend. And you know, I only talk to best friends. Now, my new best friend is Kenneth Lawson. And everybody in Hawaii knows Ken Lawson because he's on almost every night on television talking about the Kealohas. Now, for those of you that are living under a rock or something that don't know in Hawaii about the Kealohas, that story is much too broad and much too deep to talk about. But so we're going to talk to Ken about Ken, and we'll leave the, the Kealohas for another day. So welcome, Ken. Well, Thank you so much for taking the time anytime. out of your busy schedule. Anytime. Now, you teach at the law school. Yeah. How many classes is that? I teach uh, an area of criminal law, which is where I practice in criminal law. I teach criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, the Hawaii Innocence Project, professional responsibility. I'm starting a new class next semester in a new clinic called the Civil Rights Clinic. So we're going to have our students come in and work on the actual civil rights cases uh, uh, for inmates and others. Uh, in the Hawaii area, uh, so they can learn how to do this area of law also. Because I practiced in all those areas when I was an attorney. So tell me, where where were you an attorney? In Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, so you're originally from Cincinnati? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, born and raised in Cincinnati. I practiced law there, but I did cases all over the, the United States. Um, in 2003, I was recognized with Johnny Cochran as one of the top 100 black lawyers in the country. Uh, and so uh, it's been, I've done a lot of cases, like I said, civil rights cases, a lot of criminal law cases. Some of my famous clients was Deion Sanders, an old singer <laughs> named Peter Frampton. Uh, I represented all those guys, and I did a lot of cases with people that had absolutely no money. 25% of my practice um, was pro bono. In Cincinnati? Yeah. And what made you decide to come to Hawaii? Nothing made me come to Hawaii. I just ended up there. You know, I... Uh, <laughs> It just ended up, okay. Well, no, I mean, I hurt my shoulder lifting weights, oh. uh, tore my rotator cuff, got addicted to painkillers, um, opiates, ended up uh, getting prescriptions illegally, ended up going to prison. Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah. In 24 months, I was sentenced to 24 months in prison. In the meantime, my wife found a position here, a job here, uh, because she was working part-time. Um, and so after I got sober and after I went to prison, well, before I went to prison, we moved here in 2008. Um, and when I uh, went to prison, I came back. When I got out, I went to a halfway house here mm -hmm. in Kalihi called T.J. Mahoney's Halfway House. And they told me I got 30 days to get a job or I was going back to prison. Oh, boy. Right? And so um, before I went to prison, the law school had asked me to, to speak. Um, there is a program in all the states for lawyers who have alcohol or drug problems. There are lawyers' assistance programs. So when I got sober in Ohio in 2007, and when we um, moved out here, it was part of my uh, requirement that I go to the judges and lawyers' assistance program in Hawaii to make sure I was staying sober. That was part of what um, I had to do while my case, my criminal case was still pending. Mm -hmm. So when I came out here and told them my story, they asked me, do you want to go share your story at the law school? And I, so I went and shared my story at the law school, and then I went to prison. I went back to Cincinnati. I was sentenced to prison. I went to medium security prison uh, in West Virginia. When I got out, I went back to the teach, got out to T.J. Mahoney's, and then when they told me, you got 30 days, the law school had found out that I was out. Um, they said, do you want to come and talk to this year's class? And I went up there and I spoke. Uh, Professor Randall Roth hired me as a clerk, uh, and then I got hired into the Innocence Project as a manager of the Innocence Project. And that's how my journey um, got me now to being a tenured uh, faculty member at the university um, and, and teaching the future generation of lawyers on how to try cases. Very good. Wow, that's quite a journey. Mm -hmm. My goodness. And so you... Uh, Teach all of those various. I teach more courses than anybody else up there at that law school. But you know, <laughs> but that's because I love teaching. And you got the experience. 
Yeah. And yeah. I, um, but I love teaching. I feel useful. Um, and I can pass my experience on to others, right? Which yes. Is what which ultimately is what we're here to do. Yeah, that's great. Great. Now, when you talk about civil rights, um, teaching civil rights, of course, you know, I go way back and fought hard for years to get mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Act passed. And as you know, the biggest obstacle was public accommodations. Mm -hmm. That was the one that was the nastiest. And so everybody that's watching knows I was ready to sue our governor because of the hindrance of public accommodations when they vetoed the bill that does not allow medical cannabis, legal medical cannabis, if you have it, you can't fly from island to island right. with it. So I was all ready to go get him. So what I was told when I talked to a legislator that I'm ready to sue, he said, get in line. <laughs> Everybody's ready to sue yeah. him for something. But I still think we need to do that. Oh, absolutely. And, I, and again, I think that see, when I was in Cincinnati, I had the, the benefit being trained by um, some of some of civil rights, you know, historic figures, right. Fred Shuttlesworth, yes, was, had his church in Cincinnati. Reverend Ralph Abernathy right. had his church in Cincinnati, uh, and both of them, as you know, uh, was was sidekicks of Dr. King. Yes, absolutely. And, and so there's there's cases in the Supreme Court with Shuttlesworth. So um, they trained us in how to do direct action civil disobedience. Yes. Right? Um, and, and God, but, you know, Frisch passed away a few years ago. But so here, there are things that happen here, and, and I don't see enough civil rights attorneys. You know, we have Eric Seiss, and does a great job, and a couple others that may do it. But, and so what we want to do, at least with this clinic, right. is to start uh, students to, to understand this area of the law, Mm -hmm. Why it's important, the medical marijuana, just all these areas that are actually civil rights areas. Yes. And how you can use the federal court to change the law, um, no matter what the politician is doing. Well, and what I found out is how little they understand the, the uh, what is it, Title 10 um, of the Constitution, is it 10? Uh, Amendment 10 that says the state has to acquiesce, has to give up its right to the feds. The, it doesn't go the other way down, from the feds down. It comes from the states up. Our attorney general didn't seem to know that. Yeah. And she says, well, this is what the feds say, so that's what we have to do. No. And 06, remember the Supreme Court gave all of the states the rights to do their own medical care the way they want right. to. Right, right. Now, if I know this, how come she doesn't? Well, see, so there's a policy that was enforced through the DO, Department of Justice, where they were basically saying, we're going to let the states do, do this, this, right, and we're not going to prosecute you, right. right, even though we still maintain it as a law, right? So Eric Holder, right, was, was very active in making sure that, that the feds didn't prosecute states that allow medical marijuana or just marijuana, period, period. just legalize yeah. it, period. Uh, and, and anyway. But I, I do think that um, we're getting there. But I do want to sue. I haven't given that up because that they understand. Because if the state of Hawaii issues the card to anybody that medically qualifies in all islands, and yet if you have a card and you live on Molokai, the closest dispensary is on Maui. How are you going to get there if you don't? Fly. Right. And then how are you going to bring it back if you don't right. fly? And so I said this is state-sponsored discrimination. Well, it is. It is. Uh, and you know the biggest obstacle in the 1964 Civil Rights Act was state-sponsored discrimination. Right. Segregation. Segregation. Right. And, and so, again, because if you can bring alcohol from one Right. Island to the next, right? Or you can bring your own medication, right? Oxycodone. Right. From which one is a, island a to schedule the next. two. 
then you should be allowed to bring marijuana from one island to the next and or within the state. And we're not talking about just anybody smoking. We're talking about medical. Right. So that's interfering with your medical rights, your health care rights. Right. It's a contradiction. Yes. Right. Because either, either, either you're all in or you're, or you're yeah, in, right? right? Yeah. So either it's medical marijuana or it's not. And yeah. if it's medical marijuana, then it should be treated like any other medicine. medicine. Right. And uh, so I was like, whoa, but all of my listeners know. And yet we couldn't get any traction in that one. And even when several doctors wanted to talk to the attorney general, she wasn't hearing it. But, but, but that's the beauty of, of the Civil Rights Act. Like you said, you worked so hard to help pass. Because it, we don't have to talk. We just go straight to court. Well, then let's do that. You follow what I'm saying? You've so got to find, yeah. some, find somebody. So, so talking about it is, right, because that's, everybody talked about changing uh, right. desegregation. Everybody talked about the woman's right to vote. Everybody talked about all these things. But it wasn't until you got on the other end of a lawsuit that, that then things got done. Because power can, like Frederick Douglass said, power can seize nothing, nothing without demand. That's right. Right? And so the Federal Civil Rights Act gave many people um, the ability and continues to do so, right, to change law because it's there. The court is there to protect the minority, whether it's a racial minority or medical marijuana minority from the majority, right? right. And, and so it, 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 it gives us an even playing field underneath the Constitution. Because everybody, you know, the people voted the way they wanted to vote, we may still be in slavery. Of course we would. <laughs> no doubt in my mind you know about that. I, and, and no so, doubt, doubt in my mind. But, um, and another thing, by the Attorney General saying that's just illegal, what it does under the ADA rules, any handicapped person with a card, because she said this is illegal, she made a blanket statement. You mean the transporting it from one island to the period. next? Period. Yeah. By making it a blanket statement, the ADA rules say that they will not protect a handicapped person if they are doing anything illegal. She just wrote off all of those people. Just gone. Without any thought to what that does to people. Right. Yeah. So, but it's, it still gets you back to what's your remedy? Yeah. So that's where, where we are. Right. But the, right. That's the only remedy I know. Right. Yeah. So we got to find somebody. Listen, we have uh, to take a break. And when we come back, uh, let's talk some more about what's going on with the Innocence Project. Let's okay? do it. All right. We'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, see you soon. Mahalo. Aloha, Stan Energy Man here. You can see me every Tuesday at 3 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we're not on Friday anymore, so don't be looking for me on Friday. I'm on Tuesday at 3 here on Think Tech, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful studios in downtown Honolulu's Pioneer Plaza. So please join me, and we'll talk everything about hydrogen and clean energy, not only for Hawaii, but for the whole wide world. Aloha. Aloha, and we're back. And we are talking to my new best friend, <laughs> Ken Lawson. And now, you mentioned at the top of the show about the Innocence Project. What is the Innocence Project? So here in Hawaii, our Innocence Project represents anybody that's been incarcerated who has a, actual, uh, has, has a claim of actual and factual innocence. Right? So they've been put in prison for something that he or she did not do. So they, we represent anybody. So if you did the crime, we don't represent you. So we use DNA uh, evidence as a technique, one of our techniques to determine if you're actually innocent. Um, and the Innocence Project started back in 1993 by an attorney by the name of Barry Shack. 
Well, yeah, I remember yeah. Barry Shack. Right, yeah. so he was involved in the OJ case. And, uh -huh. and in fact, he was specifically brought into the OJ case because of his knowledge about DNA. Um, and so they, he and Peter Neufeld started the Innocence Project in New York in 1993. They used DNA to show everybody that, that wrongful convictions actually occurred, that innocent people um, have been locked up in prison. At least 20 people to this date uh, ha have been in prison and on death row. Uh, some of them have been killed, right? And DNA has shown that, that it's just wrong, that they're actually innocent. Um, and so we represent anybody in the state of Hawaii. Every state has one now. Oh, every state. Okay. Every state has one now, um, and every state is covered. Uh, through uh, innocence organizations. And so we all belong to a network, a worldwide network, uh, the innocence network. Um, and so ours, uh, Hawaii's, is located at the law school. I directed along with an attorney by the name of Rick Free. Mm -hmm. He's my co-director. Um, and so we have uh, students come in, they look at the applications. And part of what they have to understand is how do you determine somebody's telling you the truth? So the students help with the project. The students help with the cases. Yep, and so great. part of what they're trying to learn is because, you know, people in prison want to get out. Of course. So some of them are going to lie to you. Oh, well, of course. So how do you know who's telling you the truth and who, who's not telling you the truth? And so part of what the students have to experience is uh, investigating those cases and then presenting to us why they believe we should take the case or why we shouldn't take it. Uh -huh. so, that, so they look at all of the evidence. Yeah, if it's available. Like, you may have some people who uh, have been in prison. We got a few people who have been in prison for over 30 years. And it's clear they're innocent. But the evidence has been destroyed. Oh, boy. Right? So there's no more evidence from 30 years ago. There's no more clothing. There's, there's no more rape kit. There's nothing left to be tested. The witnesses are dead. And so, so you have to tell this person that without new evidence, there's nothing we can do. Oh, that's all. Heartbreaking. It is. Yes. It really is. It really is. Now um, you, I remember not long ago there was a GI that you went to bat for. Yeah, so we have um, a couple of individuals who um, are in the military. One, the la last month, the uh, Hawaii Supreme Court um, reversed, actually upheld uh, a reversal of his conviction. So now he was uh, uh, finally exonerated through the Hawaii Supreme Court last month after spending eight years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Oh. Um, and so right now we're trying, we're working on uh, uh, the, the compensation aspect of it. So how much is a year of your life worth? How much is eight years worth? How much should a person like that make or get, get reimbursed or get paid for years taken from their life when they're actually innocent? What happens? Okay, so now, of course, he got a dishonorable discharge. Do you get to reverse that? Yeah, so we're looking at, so right, so this just happened last month, and so our students... I remember the picture of him, yeah. Yeah, our students and the, uh, uh, our volunteer attorneys, uh, we're all looking to see what we have to do to get that reversed. So now his dishonorable become because he was a decorated soldier. Right. I mean, he just had an award for saving somebody's life, and when he gets back from tour, his tour walks off the ship, he's, he's met by police that put him under arrest. Um, and, and your whole life is shattered. Same. I mean, yes. he, had, he had a marriage, ended up getting divorced while he was of in course. prison. Yeah. You know, kids that can't come see daddy because he's away in prison. And here, you don't go, you know, a lot of our inmates are shipped to the mainland. Yes. So how do you really, how do you get hope? How do you build rehabilitation when, when the kids can't see their parents? because their parents are somewhere on the mainland. And the only visitation that you get to have is over a screen. Well, so, so then you have to fight to get all of his back, all of that, all whatever of that you can back. get from the military. And, and then and another avenue is a civil rights suit. Right. Right? And so you, could, right, so you see them on the mainland a lot, um, where they, you know, the inmates that they're released uh, sue the state or a uh, wrongful conviction and get compensated that way. Oh, but wow. it's still not, you know, like, and you talk, but, you talk to these individuals and it's like, you know, no amount of money. Look at the Central Park Jogger case, right? right? And, and Ava Duvani's um, Netflix series, When They See Us. You have four or five young men. Yeah, five young men. And Trump still wants them home. 
Right. We, we were not going to talk about him. Uh, but the idea that you can at least give this young man some hope, that you can, you can't give him back those eight years, but you can sort of help him go forward, I guess is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, and, and now, not only that, but all the other clients that we represent. So we have several individuals who, who's, um, we had one that was in the New York Times two weeks ago. Uh, our client's been in prison for 37 years. He was in the Washington Post and New York Times, and so hopefully we can get him out. Um, but can you imagine what you were doing 37 years ago, and from that day forward, you've been in prison? for something you didn't, didn't do. do. Right? It's almost like if the police came on this set right now and just took you away. Right? And then you're not seen again for 37 more years. That is just so, so hard to think about. It that is. But it's the reason why I went to law school, right? And it's the reason I think it inspires a lot of students because, you know, that idea of justice, that idea of doing good with your law degree, that idea of, of helping somebody turn their life around or saving somebody's life, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that is instilled in a lot of law students, and I think this is a good way for them to, uh, to I, I love it. the idea that the students are working on this. That's, that is just mm -hmm. such a good idea to give them real practice, right. real time, real lives. To meet real clients. Rather, rather than in a textbook. Right, because... What makes a successful lawyer, people are always asking, how, how, did, how did you end up being one of the best lawyers in the United States? Because I cared about my clients, mm -hmm. right? And so the only way you're going to learn how to care is to talk to them. They're not a, a name in a book. Well, yeah, because with public defenders, they don't get a chance to talk to the person so until, busy. The, until the day of the trial. Right, they're so, so busy, busy. right? So we can put a lot of money in prosecuting people. We can put thousands of dollars, but the prosecution and, and most and right has an unlimited amount of money. Right. The police force at their beck and call. But if you get charged as a citizen with a crime and you can't afford a lawyer, you get appointed somebody is so busy that they can't really talk to you until like right before your trial. trial. Yeah. They forget your name. They're looking in the file. Make right. And that's not. Uh, uh, a criticism of the public defender, that's a criticism of the system. Yes, that was exactly where I was going with that, that there are so many cases and there are so few public defenders. I mean, I guess there are a lot of them, but there's not enough to equal. Right. Yeah. And it leads to the wrongful conviction. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and again, when you don't have the time to put into a case, and somebody's telling you, look, I didn't do this. Right. Why don't you go talk to these witnesses? And, and because they don't have time. They don't have investigators. No. Enough of them. No. Um, it, it, well, now, we only have a little bit of time left. And speaking of investigators and what about, I've got to do this or everybody will, forgive, will not forgive me if I don't mention the Kealohas. And who is paying for all of this defense? They, they said public defenders, and they're wanting the state to the pay. The taxpayers. We're, we're How do we get it. away with that? Well, what, I think what? a lot of people were upset because um, they thought that they could at least afford to, to pay for it. Um, but again, our, keep in mind, that's our system provides for that. If you don't have the money, then, then the court has to appoint you an attorney. Um, and we see through the system that a lot of times those that have money and get good lawyers... Right. Right, walk away. Uh -huh. Right, and so the justice has a lot to do with can you afford a good attorney, and it goes back to what we were just talking about. Um, but here, yeah, taxpayers are paying for it. Oh, and that is a lot. How long has this been going on? Oh man, the case. A couple, three years. And not longer than well, yeah. What a criminal case has, um, I guess, yeah, since two thousand seventeen, two thousand eighteen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, and, and, so, and so again, it's, it's a good teaching moment for our entire state because I think that, um, you know, one statistic shows that if you live in a blue state or a red state, it doesn't matter. But if it's all blue or all red, there's your highest level of corruption, right? Because there's nobody to, to nope. push back. Right. Right? And, and, so there's, there, and so, you know, iron sharpens iron. Uh, and I think here, the teaching moment is, that um, 
But there's a lot that, that, that can be uncovered when you're doing wrong. You know, so you still got the head prosecutor still under investigation. We don't know what's going to happen with him. Keith kind of sure will be taking a leave of absence. Right? But We're he's still, getting paid. Right. Due to tax, yeah. yeah wow. Paid. Wow. What a... Now, but we all need to... I, well, everybody's following you on every moment of watching and that even that watching the evening news just to see what you have to say about it. Well, and, and, because, you know, I, I did a lot of high-profile cases, right? And so... Um, and so I used to be on CNBC, MSNBC, um, and CNN a lot. And, and so when you have a case like this, right, it's showtime. It right? is. It, it's show, <laughs> right? And, so the, and that's what was so disappointing about watching the trial. Because um, you want the lawyers to bring it. Yes. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, and so everybody's down there watching it. And, and it was, that was... When they asked for the judge instead of a jury? Well, even during the, because I sat down there for eight weeks watching a jury trial, and it was just, um, it wasn't as exciting as I thought it, it, it should have been. You know what I mean? It just could have been so much more fun. And, and, and a lot of that um, that goes on, as you know, that goes on in the courtroom, um, you're arguing the evidence, but you're arguing it in a way because you want, right? So a lot of it is about the lawyer, too, and whether or not that jury can, can be endeared to you. Right? And you have to do that with, with, with getting the jury to trust you, that you're telling them the truth about the evidence, but you're telling the story in a way. See, Louis' whole story should have been, look, I got duped. Yeah. Yeah. Right? She, right? she fooled grandma. Right? She fooled the uncle. She, right? she, she with the firefighter, all these other people. I, I didn't know either. So I'm just, right? I, I'm duped just like y'all do. And that really wasn't the defense. I mean, it had, that wasn't the defense that was presented. Uh -huh. And I think he didn't want to hurt his wife. I think so. Right. I think so. Right. And so, and anyway. Anyway. It is what it is. Yeah. But, again, it's a good teaching moment. It is. Wow. It's been quite a time with you. What, what time is up? Time is up. Can you believe that? Oh, wow. <laughs> Tell Jay to give us more time. <laughs> well... I was trying to respect your time. You said you had to yeah, leave at 12.30, leave. I, so I, I we want to be sure that we did that to respect your time and live up to our commitment. Yes, and you will come back. Yeah, Because we, there's so much more to talk about, yes. especially the Innocence Project. I really want to tell more about that, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, thank Anytime. you. Thank you again. This You're has welcome. been a real pleasure. Aloha, and we'll... See you next time.